That's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm the director of golf at Osiris, and I work at Sirius, so we came up with Osirius. I love that. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you're having a great time at the PGA Merchandise Show. I know I am, and it's hard to believe we're nearing the end of the week, but still a lot to see, a lot to do here in the Orange County Convention Center, and there's plenty to learn as well. So I'm excited to be here and moderating a panel of guys that I really expect you're going to enjoy because they've got some great material. I've just been hearing a lot about it. I've learned so much behind the curtain already, so this is going to be a treat for me. Um, for the next 45 minutes, you're going to hear from two specialists. These are two guys that have performed at the highest level, and this is about coaching, it's about learning, it's about how to get the most out of your players and out of the staff and team around you. So we've got some great stuff coming. I'm going to introduce these guys one at a time. First, we have a man whose outstanding career at LSU led to a five-year run in the NFL. First with the Detroit Lions, then as a three-year starter for the Colts. After leaving the NFL, he built a successful career at Johnson & Johnson, then became an auto dealership consultant and an owner of a Mercedes-Benz franchise. He is now a CEO of Premier Solutions, a leading fleet procurement and management company, and community involvement is a passion of his, especially activities that assist vulnerable youth and advancing entrepreneurship. He is also currently the chairman of the NFL Alumni Association. Please welcome Tracy Porter. And our second panelist, currently the assistant head coach and quarterbacks coach for the Miami Dolphins. He earned his first head coaching position at Wake Forest University. He was there from 93 to 2000. He served as head coach of the Indianapolis Colts from 2009 to 2011 and the Detroit Lions from 2014 to 2017. He's been a part of two Super Bowl winning teams in his career. By the way, I've, I've got to show you the ring he's got on. It is fantastic. He's been the assistant head coach and quarterbacks coach of the 2006 Colts, Super Bowl champions, and as offensive coordinator of the 2012 Baltimore Ravens. Please welcome Jim Caldwell. I think the mics are hot. Here we go. Welcome, guys. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for uh, joining us here at a very important week for the business of golf. And I'm trusting we have two golfers here. You guys enjoy the sport? Well, I swing at it. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> what have you seen so far? I mean, this is, this is quite a layout, isn't it? I mean, we're uh, all kids in a candy store here, but it's fun to see all the latest and greatest things in our sport. And uh, it, you know, we talked earlier behind the scenes about golf being a lifetime sport. And before we get into the heavy questions, Tracy, I thought maybe you could tell us about your introduction to the game and what golf has meant to you, both with your business and life. Certainly. So I was initially introduced to the game of golf um, probably around 16 years of age when my father told me I needed to learn a lifetime sport and I was already participating in four different sports in high school. And he happened to take me out to a course uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in the middle of the summer, probably the hottest day of the summer, and uh, didn't really like the sport because when I swung at the ball, I missed it two or three times. Um, fast forward to when I got out of the NFL, I started working for a company called Johnson & Johnson, and I found that I was, um, a little bit behind some of my peers that were going out every Friday afternoon to play golf and I was going home. So I decided for business reasons that I needed to learn how to play the game of golf uh, because of all the business transactions that took place on the golf course. And so for that reason I took up the game and then once I started practicing, uh, the competitive spirit kicked in and, and I started playing and changing clubs every two or three years. and. Um, I still play today, so I really use the game of golf to help me with my business, to introduce myself to clients, to try to close deals and, and grow my business operation. 
That is great. I uh, couldn't have said it better myself. Um, and before we get into some specific coaching questions for Mr. Caldwell here, I wanted to ask Tracy just a quick overview of what this LSU season has meant to you. I know you're a Tiger. That had to be pretty special. Yes, it was special. So I'm a former player from LSU, and I'm a season ticket holder. So I usually attend two or three home games a year. And this year was special because when they got uh, Joe Brady from the New Orleans Saints to help with the offense, that made a significant difference in LSU. So they um, were loaded on offense. They had a very good quarterback. Obviously, the quarterback won the Heisman Trophy. Um, they have three or four really great receivers. They got two or three really good running backs. They have very good Randy Moss son at tight end. And so they averaged 45 points a game. And uh, I guess what was convincing for me that I felt that they were going to win the national championship is when they went into Alabama and beat Alabama and put 45, 48 points on the scoreboard. I said, well, if Alabama can't stop them, nobody can. And of course, that happened throughout the remainder of the season and to the end, uh, even beating Clemson. So I, I definitely anticipated that they would win because, you know, that defense really got better as the season progressed. But the offense were always, they didn't have one bad game on offense all, the, all throughout the year. Yeah, special season for uh, LSU for sure, and a special season for a, a great coach there and a, and a nice hometown story. And speaking of coaches, let's turn to Mr. Caldwell. Um, we're going to talk a little about coaching and styles and how it relates to golf. But I wanted to hear first, what would you consider your style of coaching? Um, well, there's two probably things, if I want to just put it in a, a nutshell to try to keep it where it's a bit concise so everybody can, can, can grasp it. But uh, um, there's two things. It's um, expertise and empathy. Um, I think that's what coaching is all about. The expertise portion of it is obvious. You have to know what you're doing, particularly at the level in which that uh, I've been coaching for the last 20 years. I had 24 years in college, 20 years in the pros. But the 20 years in the pros were interesting because you actually get a PhD in football. But not only that, so do the individuals that are sitting in that room uh, listening to you. Uh, they know the game. Could you imagine when I first started coaching in the National Football League, my second year in, uh, Peyton Manning was sitting in, uh, in the room with me, uh, one of the, the obviously uh, the brilliant individual, very, very talented, et cetera. So you have to know what you're talking about. So the, the expertise portion is important. The empathy portion is I think you have to know where your players are. You have to get a great understanding of your players' strengths and weaknesses and um, because coaching is a service business. And your job is to make certain that these individuals improve. So, you know, how do you go about that without knowing exactly what their strengths and weaknesses are? So I get to know them. I think those two things are extremely important. Well said. And it's the same in golf. I mean, it does take a while to figure out uh, what style of learning is going to be best for each student and, and how to connect, how to connect with these folks. So um, I wanted to turn back to Tracy and just ask if there was a coach in your career, in your playing days, that that made a specific impact on you or, or really helped direct your career? And, and maybe there was a moment when you said, man, that, that's a guy that is really going to help guide me in the right direction. Yeah, the one coach that I, comes to mind is a coach, the wide receiver coach that I had with the um, Indianapolis coach, and his name was Richard Mann. And the reason why we connected so well is Coach Mann got to know me on an intimate level before. He knew what my likes were, dislikes. He knew how to motivate me. He knew I, that I wasn't one of those guys that, you know, if I dropped a ball or fumbled a ball, get in your face mask and, and scream at you. You know, I didn't respond to that type of uh, feedback or input. Well, let me, let me ask you, how did he do that? How did he learn more about you? And, and I'll throw this to Coach as well. Did, I mean, if they just come to the stadium and they work on you there and then you leave, was there, was there another way that he found out more about your style and your personality? Well, I think one of, one of the things he did is something that I learned when I worked for Johnson & Johnson. And one of the, my mentors at Johnson & Johnson shared with me a phrase, and I've never forgotten it, and it says, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so what he did is before he tried to really coach me in the off season, you know, we got to know each other. He found out about my family. He knew my kids' names, right? He knew what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, he knew what motivated me and what demotivated me. So when it came time for the season, 
you know, I responded to him because I felt a, a connection with him, so to speak. And, and my previous coaches, although they were good, and they were good teachers, they wasn't necessarily didn't get to know me that same way. Excellent. You agree with that? Does that sound right? I, I do. I'll tell you one thing that's interesting. In, in college, it's fairly um, easy because of the fact you go through the recruiting process. So you're in their home, you're in the schools, you're in the barber shop where he gets his hair cut, all those kinds of things. So you get to know them really well. In the pros, it's not that way because you draft them, but yet you still get all of the detailed background reports. But one of the things that I did, um, we'd have 90 players, players in pro football. So I would take five guys a day uh, as a head coach, and I would study those five guys, their background, their families, whether they have children, so on and so forth. And then I'd go talk to that individual, either I'd have breakfast with him or out on the field early while he's stretching. Uh, I wanted to make certain that I also just kind of laid my hands on him, to, to, you know, that human element between the two of us. Then I could find out what he liked, what he didn't like, how to make him smile. Uh, you know, when you talked about maybe a son that, that looks a lot like him or something of that nature, and then we begin able to work because I really do think the mental is to the physical 10 to 1. And if you can get between those six inches between the ears, um, you've got a chance. That is well said. But I, honestly, finding that connection is so important, knowing more about the subject in front of you who is a player, is a human who has uh, a lot of uh, needs and perhaps some some interesting characteristics, you find out all that, you become more effective as a coach. Um, I'd like to ask you something else about a conflict. Sometimes you'll have a, a player in front of you who may think he knows it all. I know this from golf. And uh, how, do you, how do you break through? What I'd like to hear is that even the great ones, Jim, still want to learn. But that might not always be the case. How do you break through and say, you know, uh, listen, Tom, I know you're having a good year with the Patriots, but, uh, you know, if you, if you held the football a little bit more like this, how do you get to an elite player who thinks he or she has it all under control? Yeah, well, you run into that every once in a while. Um, it's a, a lot less than what you might imagine. Um, usually the, the best players that I've been around have been just the opposite. They've been humble and they've been hungry. And they want to learn and from they you. they want to learn. I mean, here's the thing about pro football that's interesting because they feel if you can make them that much better, they have an opportunity to make a lot more money, extend their career a lot longer. So you don't run into that very often. But when you do run into it, I think still you have to get to know the individual. Um, you know, sometimes it's a defense mechanism, the reason why they're talking about those things and acting as if they know um, all the details of the position, et cetera. But I think that comes from your expertise. If you know exactly what you're doing, you can kind of present the case, talk to them about it. Hey, these are the differences. Take a look at this film. Here are the things that will happen if you hold the ball that way. Here are the things that happen if you don't, okay? If the wind is blowing, you know, so on and so forth. So I think if you know your craft, uh, you have a way of working around that. Well, speaking of knowing your craft, we, we have uh, thousands of golf professionals out here that teach and coach, and yet they continue to learn. They come to a week like this, and there are education classes, there are panel discussions like this. They're trying to gather knowledge themselves. What does a coach in the NFL, what does uh, Jim Caldwell do to make sure he's up on the latest techniques and, and is staying sharp? I mean, are, do you go to conferences yourself and continue to learn? There's a uh, Japanese word that's it's kaizen, uh, and kaizen means continuous improvement. And I think that goes for players, coaches, teachers, whomever it might be. So I'm always scratching and digging, trying to find a way to get better. Um, I, I, I research, I watch film, I call people, I go to clinics. Uh, you know, I'm always looking for a little bit extra knowledge, maybe a different way to say something that I've been saying all along. But also, you find that you will learn as much from your own players that you coach as sometimes you do when you're out sort of researching across the country, and I found that to be the case. Great point. Uh, Tracy, uh, I'm going to ask you something about measuring progress, and, and this could be a question for both of you, but how aware are players of their stats? How aware are players of the metrics that they can measure in their growth on the field and maybe even off the field? But were you, a, were you a statistician during your years? Were you aware of, man, this would be a great game to, to do this or do that? Were there goals that you set for yourself? And was that a way to measure progress? Well, I think when I played and even players today certainly are aware of stats. Um, and the reason I say that is because in my contract, you know, there, there were incentive clauses in my contract that if I led the team in receptions, 
I got a bonus. If I was at the conference and receptions, I got a bonus, you know, and, and things of that nature. So you are aware of your stats because, you know, you're incentivized, obviously, to, to try to hit and exceed those, those um, terms in your, in your contract. So you are definitely aware of that, and, and, you know, I was aware of that, how many catches I wanted to get at, at, on this particular game so that I could keep in track for, you know, 1,000 yards receiving or 60-plus catches in a year. Um, but I will tell you uh, one game when I played for the Lions, you know, we were in a conference with the Green Bay Packers, so we played them home and away every year. And this particular year, we played Green Bay in December. And as mentioned at the top of the hour, I went to LSU, so I wasn't familiar with cold weather. So my rookie season, we're playing Green Bay in December, and it's like minus 10 degrees. <laughs> and um, <laughs> It was the only time that I saw all the receivers, myself, the other the flanker, and the tight end tell the quarterback during the TV timeout, keep the ball on the ground, let the clock run out, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Coach, what about you? Uh, with, your, with your players, your students, we'll call them, how do you measure their progress, and are you trying to give them incentives to get better? Well, I, I think without, without question, you've got to quantify everything. Um, and nowadays, with all the metrics involved in the game of football, I think it's extremely important. Measurements, I think if you can measure it, uh, you can improve. And uh, one of the big things I used to do, I mean, back in the day before they have all of this modern equipment, I would take one of those uh, pitch count counters, and I'd count the number of throws it would take for a quarterback to get loose. Uh, so I wanted to know how many throws it took this guy to get loose. I'd keep asking, are you loose yet? Okay, we'd go through a couple other drills, are you loose? And then I realized, like, Brad Johnson, I had him at Tampa, took Brad Johnson 25 throws to get loose. Uh, you know, Peyton was a little bit different, et cetera. Well, nowadays, they have chips in the balls. Uh, so when you throw the ball, it can tell who it's going to and how fast it's going and how often this guy throws the ball. Uh, so they, they've See, now that, that is something I don't think a lot of people understand. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Know, I know there is incredible technology everything. out there, but they're measuring the speed that everything, that ball is leaving the hand. Everything is measured. And not only that, they have a chip inside of their shoulder pads or in their jersey that tells you how fast they're running, how quickly they're moving, different periods. So you can look at those things. You can tell when a guy is really pressing. You can tell when a guy is trying to take it easy. But also where it helps you just in the training process of knowing when they're at game level, game speed, and then how often you want to keep them at that level so you can make certain that they don't get soft tissue injury. So all of those measurements come into play these days. That is cool. I uh, did not know that. See, I'm learning things as we go along here. Um, in golf, you know, the long ball is always the glamorous shot. They all want to hit the drive. We have long drive championships. We're watching, we're watching uh, men and women hit the ball over 400 yards now, which is just incredible. Um, but there's a lot to the game. There's a lot of different styles of play. There's pitch shots. There's bunkers. There's playing out of rough. So I wanted to talk to you, Coach, a little bit about the different types of throws. As a quarterback coach at the moment, um, you know, you, you see the long ball, but then I'm always impressed with the finesse, the timing, the touch shots, the, the laterals. Some, I, I think of the same thing in basketball. There are people that are really good from three-point range, but you get them in for a little 10-footer, and all of a sudden the touch is gone. Tell me about the nuances of different types of throwing. What we try to do, much like golf, is that we try to put the quarterback in every position that he's going to experience in the game. Um, so sometimes that's a screen pass, which requires a lot of finesse, not only getting it over an oncoming rusher that might be 6'8", uh, with his hands fully extended, he might be 7'4", you know, or something, uh, with a wingspan, but then also maybe getting it around him. So that requires some touch and some finesse. Sometimes it takes taking it toward him. Um, so there's a lot of little finesse things. The check down passes, once the deep one's not there, how to throw the deep ball, where to place it. So in the National Football League, you know, where you're from, where you're located, you're wide open, okay? Uh, and, and because of the fact the quarterback can place the ball on, the, on your outside shoulder, which I can't get to, right? So it's all those kinds of things that you gotta throw a guy open, put the ball in the right spot. And we try to recreate that on the practice field consistently. Excellent, we were, we were talking about that backstage about trying to get that feel of actually being in a game versus practicing. Yeah, I was gonna add to that. Brian, it also is critical from a player perspective is that the coach put the player in the right situation. By that I mean, you know, if you have a slot receiver, you talk about finesse, 
you make sure you put the kind of player that can run those finesse routes because not all the speedsters that are on the outside, they might not be the best finesse receiver on the inside. So you find that out in practice, right? You find that out in preseason and game situations. But it's critical for you to put your players in a position where they can win. And sometimes your speedster on the outside may not be the best person to run those finesse routes on the inside. You know, I could see, I could see you, Tracy, in a position of being in a, in a practice and going through practice routines where you're receiving the ball at a certain speed and then all of a sudden it's game time and that thing has a little more heat on it right. and, and you might not expect it. So you, you do have to simulate game conditions during practice. I think that's great. Yeah, I think the other thing that's interesting, you're talking about technology. So we would set, they have a jugs machine that oftentimes receivers would use that shoots the ball mechanically to a receiver. Well, we would set that jug machine to the speed of the quarterback's throws. Um, so he's always getting it. If it's, uh, you know, 50 miles an hour, um, we set it to 50 miles an hour, whatever it might be. So it gets everybody kind of accustomed to working with the quarterback and his speed, even though obviously it's only a machine shooting the ball at them. <laughs> Very cool. So now if I have a, a student as a golf professional that I'm trying to help, and they may be a, a solid uh, player from the tee, but have a little trouble with pitch shots. Do you spend a little more time, depending on your player, in the, the areas of their weakness? Absolutely. We work on the weaknesses more than anything else. Right-handed quarterbacks oftentimes have a problem throwing to their left, uh, you know, because either they're not stepping toward the target or to open it up and maybe a little wider, et cetera. So we would go two to one, basically, in terms of our practice. We throw twice as more to the left than we would to the right. The right is natural for him, and vice versa for a left-handed quarterback. So placing him in position where he things that he does not do well, those are the things you got to make certain that you improve upon. Work those weaknesses. In golf instruction, we use a lot of video. Talk about uh, reviewing game film and reviewing how you're performing on the on the field of battle, so to speak. And and what was that process like in the NFL? Well, typically um, on Mondays, you know, we would have a review of the game that we just played on Sunday, and you would get graded on your performance on every play, whether it was a run or whether it was a pass. And so uh, you obviously wanted to get in the high 80s, low 90s, as far as uh, uh, plays that you did well, um, because you worked on that all week in practice. So video was a, a critical part of it. Um, but also, um, players in the NFL, and even in college, you know, you want to understand that your body is your, is your work. I mean, so, when you get in the NFL, you know, you may be persuaded because of peer pressure by other players by going out, staying out late at night. And then what happens on Monday when the lights go off and the video comes on, you sleep. And that's why players miss, right? They miss uh, aud audibles that might happen because they went out and stayed out to 2 o'clock in the morning the night before. And the next day at, when the video comes on, they're, they're sleeping in the film room. So. That's how some of the That's players right. who have uh, very good talent sometimes get cut because they can't mentally pick it up because they're too busy partying. Game film. Yeah, the game film is, um, is certainly extremely important because you have an opportunity, number one, as a coach, um, you also are being graded um, because of the fact that did you, do you see on film exactly what you coach during the week? So as a head coach, oftentimes I'm sitting down with the assistant coaches and we're going over that film before we get to the players and then we're talking about our improvements, uh, you know, things that we didn't improve upon, what's this guy doing, why is he doing that, didn't we teach him this particular technique? Um, so that kind of, it's a trickle down effect. Uh, and it's not a comfortable time, to be honest with you, uh, for, for most of the players or coaches. Uh, unless you, and it's very rarely that a guy has a perfect game. It just doesn't happen very often, so there's always something to improve upon. I think of that poor safety who's sitting in there just watching a total whiff on a tackle and, you know, having to take the heat for something like that. That can stay with you um, as it can in golf as well. You know, I wanted to talk to you, Jim, just a little bit about um, your, your opportunities throughout your career. You've, you've been the head coach, and you've also been in positions where you're specializing more on, on one part of the game. I think that has to give you better perspective. Because we could talk about one member of the team all we want, but there are 10 other guys out there that, that need to do their job in order for that person to perform. So uh, as, a, as a quarterback coach, your, your best friends are those linemen. So talk about the team aspect of what you do. 
Well, it's, you know, team expert is extremely important. Um, you know, obviously how it's broken down by coaches and then also players by position and those individuals doing their job, it's really a dependence upon one another. It's really a trust that's built uh, through practice and the practice consistently doing well builds confidence, confidence in one another. And I think that's what you're seeing from these two Super Bowl teams that are coming up. You know, right. both teams have a great feel for, for the guys that they're playing with. And also you can even feel the energy of those particular teams where it's built on the practice field. Um, it's built through that intricate sort of detailed coaching um, you know, throughout the week, and then so it translates into Sunday. So, um, you know, that, that team aspect is extremely important. As a head coach, you got to look at everything. I mean, special teams, every single player. You have to watch all of the film in detail every single day. Uh, as an assistant coach, you're worried about your guy and your guy playing well, right. but you're hoping and anticipating that the guys in front of you who are being coached by someone else are going to do their job as well to uh, aid you in doing yours. How, how often does the entire coaching staff get together without the players and talk about, you know, the, the whole movement here? I mean, what, are we all on the same page? Are we all working on the right things? And are you being graded and saying, hey, you know what, this part of the team needs a little bit more, this one's doing all right, but let's help each other out? How often do you meet as just coaches? Every day. It's a daily process. Um, we talk about not only just overview of what we anticipate getting out of practice, but we look at the game film, look at the practice film, and we talk in detail about those things. So it's constant communication. I, I was telling someone, you know, it's 44 years for me, and my schedule's always been 4.30 in the morning to about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, and um, so that's a long stretch. But during in between those time periods, there are a lot of conversations that go on, a lot of watching a film, a lot of evaluating, and, uh, and certainly trying to improve your team. See, we can't be too sad about the hours of a golf pro. I'm hearing some pretty heavy uh, commitment here, Tracy. One of the things I'll add to that is, is, you know, how do you get the most out of teams? I've been fortunate and blessed to go from collegiate to professional sports and, and then now working for, or right out of the NFL, working for Johnson & Johnson for 14 years in sales and sales management and marketing and then on to owning a Mercedes-Benz dealership, uh, having to get results through others. Right. So one of the things that I learned is that what was motivating to me as a player when I had to respond to coaches and what was demotivating. Right. And, and I used that when I got into the business world, because once I started managing people at Johnson and Johnson and sales reps, I had to take the spotlight off of me as an individual salesperson and get results through others. So not everybody can make that transition. But in order to get the best results, you have to be happy with the spotlight shining on somebody else as a coach than it's shining on you. As better your players and the more awards your players get, that ultimately uh, points to you as a, as a coach. All right, so one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, that, that I've learned and I implement today, even in my business, is, is I ask a question to all of my teammates, all of the people that are on my team, what has happened to you recently that's been motivating? Right? And I take notes, copious notes of that. And then I also ask, and this could be using golf as well, what has happened to you recently that's been demotivating? And believe it or not, I found out that not everybody is motivated by money. Not everybody's motivated by saying, I'm going to give you an X number of thousand dollars worth of raise or a bonus. One of my key performers at Johnson & Johnson, what I found out when I posed those questions, he was a guy that did a lot of stuff at home. He, built and went to Home Depot and Lowe's and liked to create stuff with his hands. So what I did for him, instead of giving him a huge bonus, I went and got him gift cards for Home Depot. And you would have thought that I was Santa Claus, <laughs> right? But I was, I, was, I was really going after him and what specifically motivated him. And he was great, right? And so the other thing that I learned uh, about team sports is that it's on a bell-shaped curve. So if you think about your kids, kindergarten, eighth grade, 12th grade, right, it's, it's the class gets grades on a bell-shaped curve. So in other words, 10% of the class are gonna be A students. 10% are gonna be struggling students. You're gonna have, and we call that the A group, and about 15 to 20% are gonna be B, B players, but the bulk of your team are gonna be C players, get the C grades, and that's what happens in school, any school, right? So what I did when I started trying to get results through others, I focused a lot of time on those C players because if the A players were already superstars, they were already doing well and, and probably weren't going to do significantly more better. 
but the C players, you could always get a little bit more out of them, and that was the bulk of your team. So if you get the C players to improve by 10%, your overall results were significantly improved. So that's what's worked for me in the world of business, and that's what I learned from being in sports. That's great, and, and that goes to the point of expectations, I think, and what you expect out of your team and how you find ways to motivate them. The, the gift cards at Home Depot doesn't happen unless you're the type of coach or the type of leader that knows more about your team, exactly. and I think that's really, really important. Um, on the topic of expectations, what sort of uh, goals do you set for your players and for yourself? And do you have to deal with negativity, people who are too demanding of themselves and, and get down on themselves for not reaching results? How, how high do you set the bar, and how do you manage that with your players and your team? Um, well, I, I think, you know, obviously in the National Football League, the, the number one goal is to, to reach the Super Bowl and win it. Uh, and uh, so oftentimes all of those things. I love uh, how you're saying that, holding the mic with this hand right here. <laughs> <laughs> kind of nice. Yeah, there, it's, it's really a lot of fun. But, but, but a lot of those things that you do during the course of the year kind of lead to that. But we try to break it down into quarters of the seasons. There's 16 games. We break it into quarters. And what we want to do is make certain that we at least uh, win three out of the four games in that particular quarter. Um, you want to win your division. To get in, winning division gives you an opportunity, obviously, to get into the playoffs. Um, and then also, if you don't get into the, win the division, you want to certainly get in the wild card. Uh, you want to win your conference, and you want to win, obviously, uh, the, the Super Bowl. So, so what we do is just try to focus in on small portions of that, not necessarily always talking about the Super Bowl. We talk about our overall goals initially at the end of the beginning of the season, and then we don't talk about it at, until we get to that point at the end. But during that time, we look at those quarters, and we look at every practice, and we look at every drill, and look at every play, and we try to break it down minutely because if we're doing those things right, there's an old saying, take care of the little things, and the big things will take care of themselves. Uh, so we try to take care of those little things. And to add to that, one of the things I learned about reaching and exceeding goals, you guys all have heard that people set New Year's resolutions, and by February, those resolutions are gone because people don't keep them up. So one of the things that I learned I just had a donut this morning. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> One of the things I learned about being able to achieve and exceed, reach your goals and exceed goals is instead of just verbalizing them, which most people do for New Year's resolutions, put them in writing. And so I've done that on my teams at the Mercedes dealership. I've done it on my teams at J&J, &J, and I do it on my teams now with Premier Solutions. So I would ask you, Brian, what are your specific goals this year in 2020? And then you would tell me, well, I want to reach this level. And I said, okay, write it down in your handwriting on your book. And then that's your goal. And I said, okay, now if you want to improve your sales by 15%, what specifically are you going to do to get there? Well, I'm going to improve my product knowledge skills. You know, I'm going to go out there and, and call on my specifically target, my top physicians or top doctors or whatever. But whatever those specific steps are in order to reach your goals, you put it down in writing. And then the last key part is you have to put those goals somewhere where you see it every day. So for me, I put it in the mirror. Every day I go to the mirror because I have to brush my teeth, wash my face. So every morning, every night, I see my handwritten goal. You got that list there? There, 365 days a year. So you're more likely to reach and exceed those goals if they're in your handwriting, you know, somewhere you can see it every day versus just saying verbally, I want to improve by 10% or I want to make the Pro Bowl or I want to do whatever. I want to be an A golfer, I want to improve my handicap by five, you know, lower it by five points, then specifically if you see those goals every day, you're more likely to reach them. Great point. That's uh, good advice for all of us. And, you know, I, I wanted to talk to Coach a little bit as well about enjoying success. Without naming any names, we, we've heard programs that even when they're winning and winning and winning, it's, it's a grind. And how do you, how do you balance a little celebration, a little joy for what you've accomplished without letting your guard down because you got next week right around the corner. Well, you know, one of the things that um, I think is a mark of, of championship teams, at least the ones that I've been around, I had the great fortune of uh, being at a college where we won a national championship at Penn State, and, and obviously you mentioned the, the pros, et cetera. But one of the things you notice about championship teams um, and, and their behaviors is this. When we walk into the meeting room on Monday to show them the film for the game, 
it was always exactly the same. They never got too high, they never got too low. So you could walk in the room after a great victory, you could not tell the difference on Monday. Uh, and I think that's important because what you don't want to do is have the huge swings of emotion right. because it's tough to get up for a big game. And then the next game you'll see some low. You see that week in and week out. But the teams that are consistently just level um, all through the year, um, I think, um, does not have nearly as many mood swings. And I think it reflects in the record as well. Interesting. And to add to that, Brian, I'll tell you a funny story. So my dad was a coach and athletic director on the high school level. And he would come and watch me play in high school and also in college. So when I was a sophomore at LSU, I think I, I scored my first touchdown as a wide receiver. And, you know, I had, I did this little dance, right, celebrating my touchdown catch. And so after the game and came out of the locker room, my dad, you know, come over here and talk to me. And he said, um, why are you doing a dance after scoring a touchdown? I said, because I was excited. He said, is there any play on offense that's not designed to score a touchdown? I said, no, all of them. If everybody executes, all of them are. He said, well, look, I don't want you dancing in the end zone. Act like you belong there, right? If you execute every play, you should score every time you have an offensive play. So he said, if you, if you execute uh, flawlessly, act like you belong there. You shouldn't be celebrating or dancing in the end zone. So from that point forward, <laughs> no more dancing in the end zone. <laughs> that's, that's great advice. In fact, earlier this year, I, I won't mention the player, but it's a pet peeve of mine. And I'm, you know, my experience in the NFL is zero. But as a, as a fan and as a viewer, it, it irks me to see someone doing a celebration dance when the team is down by two touchdowns. Uh, I mean, what does that do for the, for the rest of the team and the mood in the locker room? I mean, these are the, the nuances, but I, I look at, a, at someone celebrating when the rest of the team is all trying desperately to get back up. Talk about the levels of, uh, you know, let's call it celebration uh, at, that you see on the field, Coach. Yeah, every once in a while you'll find, you know, a guy or two is just absolutely clueless. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's just a fact, you know. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, you'll find out also that when someone is doing that in that situation, particularly where they shouldn't be celebrating, you, at, the coaches are going to talk to them. But the most important guys, the team leaders talk to them. Uh, and they get them quickly. Uh, and, and oftentimes you'll find out that that carries a lot more weight with a young guy who's trying to learn his way in the league than even a coach. Having you know, his teammates come over. At, absolutely. So I think that peer pressure is extremely important. And, and that, that talks to leadership on the team itself. And, and uh, Tracy, has it always been like that in, in your years as a player? Could you identify who those veterans were who took an extra role to really go out of their way and try and help you? This gets into mentorship a little bit, but do some players come to mind that would take you aside and say, listen, I, we got to talk here? Well, yes, I can think of a specific incident that happened in um, Detroit. You, you would think the quarterback position, most people perceive that to be the leader of the team, but that's not always the case. Um, the person who gets up and goes to the whiteboard, that's not always the leader in the room. It could be the person who, when you have a break and you go in the bathroom and they said, hey, this is what we're about to do, and everybody follows, that's the true leader of the team. So we had an a incident in Detroit where our head coach at the time was Monty Clark. Um, we were about to go play Tampa Bay, and Tampa is always warm. But because we lost the weekend before, he wanted us to go outside. And it was November, December, so it was cold. And you know the players were in the locker room grumbling before practice and saying, I can't believe he's making us go outside in 20 degree weather to practice when we're about to go play Tampa Bay. So we had an all pro defensive end by the name of Al Bubba Baker, who decided that because of his status on the team, he said he was going to change this decision. So when we start doing seven on seven or 12 on tw uh, 11 on 11, rather, um, all the quarterbacks wear a red X on their jersey. And so he came around the end and hit Gary Danielson, who you probably know. He hit him and knocked him on the ground. And they blew the whistle, said, Al, don't hit the quarterback. That's why he has a red X. Second play, he comes around, hits Eric Hipple, knocks him on the ground. <laughs> Al, don't hit the quarterback. Third play, Jeff Kemp, he hits him. Monty blows a whistle, we're going inside. <laughs> <laughs> clever, clever. Oh, man. We're, we're nearing the end of our session, but I wanted to ask uh, 
a question to the coach here. This isn't an easy question, but uh, every once in a while, I think there are teachers who who have to figure out what not to say. They might see something, a flaw in, in the motion, they, and yet the game is coming up. Sometimes being a great coach is knowing when to not say anything. Does that uh, ring a bell with you? Oh, oh, there's no doubt about it. That's one of the things that I, that I often I talk about, particularly when I'm talking to, to young coaches. Um, the most important part of, of what you do is learning when to get out of the way. Um, I, I'll use Peyton as an example, and I've had many guys, you know, Matt Stafford, Joe Flacco, you know, Brad Johnson, Sean King, a number of very, very talented individuals. But some things they do so well, uh, and oftentimes momentum will get rolling in, as, in terms of completion of passes and making things happen, unscheduled plays, things of that nature, that rather than coach some little minor detail that might slow them down from a mental, just back up. Yeah. You know, just kind of, you just got to know when to kind of let them do what they do best. Yeah, and I, I think we see that in golf. You could get too caught up in the details when really it's just how, how are they going to get the golf ball in that hole in, in an efficient way? Don't worry too much about all the little hitches here and there. You know, one of the things interesting, you know, I watch, uh, is it Wolf? Is that the guy yes. that's got the swing yep. that goes up and around? Unorthodox, you know? yeah. but effective. So, so oftentimes you may find out, guy, you, you take a look at the difference between Philip Rivers and Peyton Manning. Uh, one, a very classic sort of a passer that does everything technically right in Peyton, and the other, Phillip, doesn't look quite the same as Peyton, but equally as effective in terms of throwing the football, you know, when they were in their prime. So, um, so I, I do think that rather than someone trying to set their mind on the fact that they're going to make Phillip Rivers change his throwing motion after he's been throwing that way, you know, all the way through college, his dad probably taught him how to throw when he was a youngster, uh, would be an awful mistake. Now, some little tweaks here and there, that's different, but overhaul changes, um, that's right. let them do what they do. Jim Furyk comes to mind. You get that unique swing, and, and many of us who have been in the game for a long time give his dad a lot of credit for getting him on the right track and not necessarily jumping in and changing that. It was so effective. Sometimes you've just got to sit back and let someone do what they do really well. Well, speaking of that, Brian, one of the things that I recall that helped me tremendously in the game of golf is I went to Byron Nelson's golf school, which was like a four-day school in Texas. And what was very beneficial to me is, you know, the first couple of days, you know, you hit every club in your bag at least 50 times, and they took video of it. But on the last day, they teamed you up. It was a team of two with a golf professional or assistant professional. And they said, OK, we're going to teach you course management. And so you would get on the tee. You would hit off the tee wherever your ball lies from there. You would go, and a golf pro professional would say, OK, Tracy, what are you going to do from here? And you'd say, well, based on my game and my skill level, <clears throat> this is what I plan to do. And I remember I hit into the woods and I got an a, a iron, like a six iron, and put it back in my stand. So I said, well, I'm going to hit it low and hit it towards the green. He said, your last name is not Woods. Right? <laughs> so your skill, you need to chip yeah. right back How out. How about this way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of going this way, and then, you know, try to hit onto the green. But <laughs> Managing you know, your game. Of course, course managing it, because to your point, when you're on the driving range, it, everything's flat. But when you go out on the course, you could be on a side hill lie, you know, you could be in a bunker. And you need to learn how to hit that in, in game situations. The spotlights are shimmering off the jewelry here uh, of Coach Caldwell. But I want to ask you guys, what are you most proud of? What are you most proud of with the game? And what are you most proud of outside of the game? Just a, just a quick thought in each arena, if you will. Um, you know, I think. Um you obviously have to be proud of your family. I've been married for, for to be 44 years in March um, to my wife, who I literally grew up with. Uh, we've been dating since we were in ninth grade. And uh, we have four great kids and three great grandsons. So, um, you know, we are uh, certainly proud of them. But um, from a coaching standpoint, uh, it, that was the thing I had thought about a little bit. And probably about my most memorable moment in coaching is this. We, um, I was at Wake Forest at the time. We were struggling along, trying to build a winning team, winning character, et cetera. And we ended up in 1999 going to the Aloha Bowl and winning the Aloha Bowl, uh, which is one of the rare bowl games at that time they had been in. Now, obviously, they've gone to plenty. But my son was on the team. Uh, so I had a chance to coach my son, which was absolutely cool. outstanding. You know, and, and I learned a lesson. You know, oftentimes you'll say, hey, I'm going to coach your, son, your kid just like my son. 
it's different. <laughs> it is Except that. Different. Yeah, Except and that. but I'm going to tell you what it was. It was so much fun because yeah. number one, he acted. He didn't act like he owned the place. Um, you know, he was a great teammate. But uh, to see him have some success, you know, under my watch was was a lot of fun. Well, he had great guidance. I can tell that. An achievement you're extra proud of, Mr. Porter. Um, probably the biggest one is is being able to play collegiately uh, as a student athlete. Um, at LSU, I was all academic, all SEC in the School of Business, graduated in four years, so I was very proud of that. And then being able to go to the next level in NFL, as you know, 3% of collegiate Odds athletes are against make you. it yeah. to the NFL. So being able to be in that club, you know, is, is, is a high point for me. And then from a professional perspective, just being able to parlay things that I learned collegiately, high school and professionally, and use that in the, in, the, in the business world, whether it was working in corporate America for Johnson & Johnson or running a Mercedes-Benz franchise or in my own business now, being able to use some of those same skills that I learned in, in playing sports and helping others uh, in, my, in my business. You guys are doing great things, and we really appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom and your insight with everyone here at the Orange County Convention Center. It's been a great week for us, and it's stuff like this that makes it extra special. Before I let you go, one word answer, Chiefs, 49ers. Mm -mm. One word answer. What do you think, Coach? I'm going to have to give you two words. Don't, <laughs> don't bet. <laughs> <laughs> Life advice. See, he's going beyond the game. I like that. No commitment? No, because, you know, number one, you're not, you can't tell. Um, I think the sentimental choice is going to be the Chiefs because of Andy, but, yep. you know, not getting a, you know, a championship, et cetera. Um, but I got friends on both staffs. Uh, I know both groups, and I'm, I, I root for my friends. In this particular case, I just want to see a great game. Tracy? And I would say the Chiefs only because I saw that the, the Chiefs shut down arguably the best running back in the league and Derrick Henry. Um, the week before when they played Tennessee. And so if you can shut down the running game, I think you certainly have a, a good chance to win. But also, separate and apart for light, would like to add that uh, I'm chairman of the board of the NFL Alumni Association. And we have, we're certainly in the, in the game of golf. We, as uh, two of our biggest fundraisers are golf events. Uh, we have 36 chapters around the country. And each of those chapters have golf fundraising events in those local chapters. And the winner of those local chapters, we invite to an event that we call the Super Bowl of Golf. This year in April, that event will be held at Pinehurst. So um, uh, we're looking forward to that. And then this is the first year we've been awarded the opportunity to host a golf event in combination with the NFL Draft, which will be this spring as well in Las Vegas. So any of you in the audience that have a product or service that's related to golf, we certainly could use your help. In the audience, we have our CEO, Beasley, please stand, Beasley Reese. So any of you in the audience, um, please give us your business cards. If you have products or services that are related to the game of golf that could help us, you know, we're all ears. Tracy Porter, Jim Caldwell, guys, thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. Round of applause for our panelists. The show goes on. Listen, folks, enjoy the day, enjoy the rest of the week, and have a great 2020 season. Thank you so much for being here.